So, uh, we have more props to talk about. Uh, this time with our prop master from the second season, Jeff Moore. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's so great to be here, i got to tell you. For sure. Just look at you all, Twin Peaks fans. <laughs> Love it. Makes me very happy. So this is exciting because not only are you a, a prominent figure in the Twin Peaks world, but you're local. I am local. I live in Sammamish just down the road from here. Uh, never planned that, but here I am. It's <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, so let's let's get into it with the uh, sure. with the uh, Twin Peaks stuff. Uh, so you started in season two, first episode of the second season. Uh, did you know what you were getting into? <laughs> well, when I got this job, I was uh, filming, doing a film in New Orleans, and I missed the first season completely because I was three or four months in the bayous and um, never watched television. And this was going on during that time. I came back and I uh, was asked by an assistant of mine, do you want to do a show called Twin Peaks? And I go, well, I've heard of that. That's how much I knew. <laughs> I really had not seen one frame of it. And so uh, he said, I got the phone number. Give him a call, but there's a caveat attached, attached to that. And I go, okay, what's the caveat? He goes, you got to hire the person who gave me this, this phone number. And I said, okay, okay, I'll put that in my pocket. And I called, and I got an interview. And literally um, just kind of walked into the room and uh, would not ever seen a frame of the show. <laughs> so I was walking into a mystery in a mystery. Yes. <laughs> yes. So obviously the, the question there would be, uh, Twin Peaks has such a strong aesthetic. Uh, so what kind of parameters were you given coming in cold? Well, I think the parameters were set with the um, watching it. Okay, having not, I mean, I literally got hired. I went in the very first day I went in to do my paperwork and um, had not seen one frame yet. Still hadn't seen anything. And I was at this point in Twin Peaks, in the soundstage. So going um, from zero to 100 miles an hour like that, I signed out for uh, a, um, a copy of the pilot so that I can watch it. I, again, have not seen it. And um, I put it in to the machine. First, I had to sign a paper that sort of swore up and down. I wouldn't do this, that, or the other. And uh, so I signed this paper, got my tape, went into one of the offices, and sat down and started watching it. <laughs> and then, just like everybody here, the first three notes yes. came across <laughs> that screen. And I just went, oh, God, where am I? <laughs> and then the credits rolled. And, you know, the Twin Peaks comes up, and I'd never seen anything like that. So I was just going, I'm definitely in a place that is, I have no idea, but here I am. <laughs> you know, so that was really exciting for me. I, I haven't left since, actually. Yeah. I've, been, I've been in Twin Peaks since then, so it was a great experience. Yes, we all have, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, especially in the second season, the, the, the sets and the props are very rich. Uh, you have a lot of drinkware <laughs> that's paired with certain characters, all with a, uh, mostly with a mid-century uh, theme. Can you, can you talk about some of those choices that were made? Well, I think the one thing that was going on at the beginning of Twin Peaks, there was a prop master who did the, uh, the pilot. And then when um, another prop person came in between um, episodes one and the beginning of three, and that's when David Robinson came over and became the prop master for uh, the first season from, um, from episode three on. Um, I guess uh, the question again was whether I mid-century yes the aesthetic decor thing. and and perhaps. I looked at the pilot and I s did not know the time I was in. <laughs> I didn't know if I was in 1920 mm -hmm. or if I was in 1986, 1990, whatever. 
So I had started putting together a list of questions I wanted to ask David, and um, because he was the elusive butterfly that you know you had to try to catch and uh, get your answers to, because that's where it all lied, and Mark as well. Um, so I got my question together for David, and my question was on this exact thing. First thing I asked him was, um, can I do this, can I do that, and can I do this? Which all kind of went around, period. You know, 1930, 1950, whatever it was that I picked up from watching the pilot. Jeff, you can do anything you want. <laughs> this is an alternate universe. <laughs> now, I need you to get me I've always activated recorder. First thing I, I mean, that was the very first thing he said to me. And uh, I said, okay. I had kind of read the first um, pilot, I mean, not the pilot, but the first script of season two, and knew that that was kind of coming. Um, but it was extremely important to David that we uh, get exactly what he wanted, and that was the voice activated thing. Because there was a change between the seasons there. We had the original Diane on the desk when he came home and was shot. And then when we came in, my team came in, we had to uh, do a little shifty whipty over there and put in the voice activated one. So my challenge was to try to get something as close as I could to get looking like it and to also get the voice activation. So it was a little bit more sophisticated of a tape recorder than the one they had in the pilot and the rest of the first season, so. If, uh, if you missed our first panel about uh, uh, identifying and collecting props, uh, the main recorder used by Cooper is a bit of a clunkier Panasonic, and so for the two voice activation scenes, I think one was in the first season finale and uh, one in the second season premiere, uh, it was swapped out with a sleeker, realistic model and a few of the nerds in this room have collected them. Yes. <laughs> well, that one that you're talking about at the end of, um, and I know what he did, what David, what, uh, David Robinson did, uh, is actually <coughs> a, almost like Diane. Looks almost like her. All he did was tape over the name Realistic or whatever it, that one was made from. I don't know who did that one. But there was nothing voice activated about it. It, it did not, that, it wasn't a voice activated uh, tape recorder. That's why David, the first thing out of his mouth was, I need this. You know, so, because they just sort of do whatever they had in their hand, um, uh, you know, the prop team. So that's what we, um, they ended with, and then, then I started with the new one. So we know David Lynch is a very hands on director. With very particular wants. Uh, do you have any memories of any of the other directors that worked on the show uh, and their specific requests or visions? Probably the most, um, a good story, uh, Diane Keaton, mm -hmm. I'll remember her doing her episode, um, was extremely, uh, extremely into props and really wanted some odd things. So uh, in that particular episode, we had the crawling spider, we had the Maytag men smoking, uh, we had the police officers that did their little trio of each other going by camera. Um, and um, her, her thing was that she wanted uh, to, she couldn't talk to, up, she was having a problem with upstairs, that's what I called the office, the one upstairs. Um, they were trying to bring her in a little bit. Uh, because she was just Diane. She just is a creative soul and just really knew what she wanted to do. And uh, one of the things that she really wanted to do is, if you remember the spider underneath the table, um, it was just a black spider. Script said black spider. She goes, I need, she asked production, I need to make that a spider that I can see better. And they said, no, 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 no. They sort of put her away on that. And what it would have been was somebody to paint uh, something on the existing spot, the real spot. So she came over to me and she secretly had a, a wish. Can you make this happen? 
and of course we did for her. And uh, what we did is we got the, the spider wrangler, and uh, he uh, he gave us the spider. And my assistant, uh, Richard Robinson, you you'll see on on the on the credits as well. Um, I took a vegetable ink thing that we had created, and we painted that spider. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing on her episode, which was a purely my idea, which the one thing I can say I was a part of was the dinner with Josie. If you remember at the end when um, they said, uh, let's bring out the main course, Josie. We'll take the main course now, right? So we were in the production meeting for the show and nobody had an idea of what that was going to be. And so I had a couple of things in my uh, in, that I was thinking of myself. One of them was a big giant octopus cooked and on a tray, right? Um, uh, just the tentacles of a couple of them. And the other one <clears throat> was, of course, some uh, ugly fish because of Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. But the one I really was holding in my pocket, which was my idea, was to have the pig face. And so I had these three things in my pocket to throw at the production meeting as an idea. And I came, I, first thing that came out of my mouth was, well, why don't we just do the face of a pig with an apple out of his mouth? <laughs> <laughs> Done, over with, next. So they, they bought it, they loved it, and that was purely <sighs> something that they actually uh, trusted the department to be a part of and, and to create. So that's one of my proud props. Awesome. Yeah. So. Food is not something <laughs> we typically think about when we think of props from the show, uh, but it came up a few times. Uh, you told me a story earlier about Richard Beamer uh, and a request that he made. Beamer was my favorite prop actor on the show. <laughs> if you watch season two, season two is laced with so many actions when it comes to props. I mean, they kept me running, they kept our department going, more so than almost any of the other um, uh, the first season for sure. Now, I, I never went beyond the second season because I went off and did a movie with Mark Frost called Storyville. And I was also uh, privileged to do David's on the air pilot. Um, um, so we were going to, um, we were just saying, um, you question again was Richard Beamer and his. Richard. His Richard. <laughs> Richard, every day he would come into the sound stage. Okay, we had these big doors in the back. We were coming out of the parking lot and we all parked there. And Richard would come in, all Richard up. He'd start getting into Ben, you know, his character. And he would uh, find me. And he'd go, Jeff, this is what I want to do today. And, and, and he just, a lot of the stuff you see Richard doing that has nothing to do with anything written in a script. And he would just say, okay, I want it. Uh, I want to do this, I want to do that, and then we'll do this. And I'm going, okay. So I had to prepare for that. He either ate, <laughs> smoked, or did something that he was always busy. He was a prop actor. Brad Pitt is one of the modern day, uh, I would call, prop actors that always has something to do, and want something to do. Whatever, you'll see it. But watch the show. In season two, you'll see Richard constantly doing something. And one of his key things, when he started shifting into nice Ben, he wanted to eat celery, quit smoking, and <laughs> eat carrots. Okay? So I didn't know that. It wasn't in the script. So when I come in uh, one day, he goes, uh, Jeff, get me a bunch of carrots. And oh, that began the celery and carrot yeah. work. Yeah. So that transitions well into uh, the difference between scripted and unscripted props. Yes. Uh, I want to hear about some of the things that were thrown your way on the fly, uh, as opposed to what was specified uh, very explicitly in, in the script. Well, you're looking at one of them right now in front of you, the, the, the ball, the red yes. rubber balls. We were doing that scene in the Great Northern, and uh, it was L, one of our men, kind of like, you know, doing his thing on the floor. 
David was directing. And um, my big thing that day was I had fishermen with fisher poles and people walking in the, in, you know, in the lobby doing their thing. Uh, so um, we were all getting kind of lined up, you know, you just sort of get into a rehearsal mode and, you know, David brings the actors out and we kind of go through the scene and um, he sends them back to their dressing room and they get ready for their scene. Um, I was in no problem mode at all because I had, I was covered, right, and everything was good. And that's the thing about a prop department is you can just get thrown into a whirlwind in a matter of a second. Um, and then um, David came out on the stage and goes, all right, I want everybody to take a coffee break right now and go have a donut. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. First time I've seen him do this, uh, which he did more uh, in the future. But he said, I'm rewriting the script, this scene. So we all just went and got a coffee and whatever. And uh, I got... Scott Cameron, who was our first AD, came over and goes, Jeff, David wants to talk to you. So um, I go over to his, he was sitting in one of the booths there at, at the Great Northern, and he said, Jeff, I want you to go find me as many red rubber balls as you can find. <laughs> and I need them right now, and I need them as quick as you can get them in here. So I'm going, okay, Red River Falls, I'm thinking to myself, this would be, I'm, first of all, I say, no problem, David, no problem. That's the, always the answer. Right. And um, so I'm thinking to myself, this is not going to be an issue whatsoever. I'm just going to go down to Toys R Us and go, when they existed and go grab some Red River Falls. Right? So I knew where there was one. But it was a bit of a distance. I had to drive from Van Nuys to Studio City. And... Um, so I go into Toys R Us, all proud that I have my rubber, rubber balls, and it's going to be no problem. Walked in, couldn't find one. Not one. So all of a sudden, I was back to zero, and I had to get this, and the clock is ticking, ticking, ticking. They're waiting on you, Jeff. They're waiting on you. And so the first thing that popped in my head was Thrifty Drugstore. Mm -hmm. And there happened to be one right near the, the Toys R Us. And so I went in there and I had my fingers crossed and my legs crossed and everything I could cross to hope that there was going to be something because otherwise I was going to go down a deep rabbit hole. And uh, I walked in there and I went to the toy department, straight to the toy department, and I saw two bags net of these pink, these ones here, hanging. And then I went, and, and there was, I was really lucky because there was a second thrifty literally two doors down. <laughs> this was Ventura Boardwalk Madness of uh, why don't we put two fifties next to each other? <laughs> and uh, so I went over there, and they had three oh. bags. So at that point, I go, I got it. <laughs> I did. I got them all there, and I ran back to stage. I had no idea why he wanted these rubber balls. He just said, I need this. Find it. And so I did. And when I came back. <sighs> Here they are, here they are, you know, yeah. what do you think? Okay now, and then, okay, okay, Jeff, go away, you know, and he took those and handed them to all the sailors that were on the set who I had seen earlier in the day, and um, he had them um, start bouncing it and playing with them, and I went, oh my God, I had no idea what this was for, <laughs> but it was one of those, let's, Let's just um, go into David's land here. And it was just like, he took all that time, stopped the show. It was a short scene, if you remember that scene. It was not very long. And he took, um, he took all that time to just write a couple of different shifts and have Elle do something different. And, and, and Cooper was going to say something different. And I think uh, Mark Cross's dad was there too as well. Um, and we um, did the scene essentially as it was written, except for it didn't have pink <laughs> bouncing balls. <laughs> and it was just great, because I just laughed. <laughs> and I just went, I love you, David. <laughs> you, know, you know, and I, it was, it's one of those great moments into a piece for me.
that was probably the most surprising. And of course, like I said, Diane was always throwing a little thing up, you know, a little thing here, a little thing there. Um, pretty much all of them stick, stuck to the script, you well, know. Let's go in that direction then. Uh, how detailed were the, the props? How detailed were the descriptions in the script? Uh, what did you go off of to prepare for it? Well, everything's on the page. There's nothing that goes on camera that is not on the page. That is the word in film and television. It's, if it's not on the page, then why are we talking about it? So everything that you see is written, but the caveat, what changes anything, what makes it different, is the director. You have a little bit of an input on it too because when you come with stuff to show your director, for us it was many directors, what you think you have read, and this is what my interpretation is, you never come with less than three to four different prop choices for each thing that they've written. So the detail was, I need a knife. Okay, so I need, a, 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 let's talk about the knife from uh, One Eye Jets. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the arm gag, mm -hmm. right? Jean Renault's, uh, Jean Renault's knife that he wears around his wrist. Now that was, was very specific. There was just no way around. Uh, this is what I had to get. So I went off to, I had two prop houses that I worked with. One was Ellis Mercantile and the other was Camp Prop Room. And I knew that Ellis Mercantile would have, um, have this type of a, a gag, because that's what we call them. It's a gag. And um, so I went over to uh, Ellis, and then I realized, as I'm reading the script, I realized that he's going to stab somebody with it. You know, there's eventually going to be a, a murder with this knife. And he plays with it. Now, he really started, uh, Michael Parts really loved this prop. <laughs> and, you know, he would wear it even when we weren't shooting <laughs> on, you know, on camera, you know. And so I had to get a rubber one made for the knife because he had to stab the strawberry, which was, <sighs> I don't remember that being in the script, but it was like the perfect thing that happened at that moment. So I have to say that anything that is written is kind of what you work with and then your aesthetic thought as the prop master, the direction that the, the director gives you, and then knowing the character that you're giving it to is huge. I knew that Michael Parks was getting, gonna be wearing this and I knew his character, you know, though he was new in the show, um, was a, a bad guy. And he was an egomaniac, and he was a murderer, and he was all these things. And I also knew how Michael was as an actor. <clears throat> so you put all those things in your head, it's so strange that you kind of come up with things from that type of a uh, whirlwind of stuff going on in your head, trying your best <laughs> to nail it, you know. There's nothing better than a director telling you, perfect. <laughs> and when you hear those, you just walk away, turn around, next, you know, so. It's always on the page, it's always on the page. So, on, on the page, there's sometimes some privileged information. Uh, I know Twin Peaks was notoriously secretive about certain reveals. Uh, people who weren't in those scenes didn't necessarily get to read them in advance. But all of the scenes pertain to you as the prop master. Correct. Uh, can, you, can you tell us about a, a, a certain, secret meeting? Certain secret meeting? Yeah. <laughs> so we were, um, it, there was a, uh, you know, we had to solve this thing. ABC just destroyed the show by making us solve this thing. So, yes. yeah, boom, that whole thing. And, um, 
we were getting ready to reveal our killer. Now they had three people, and we've all seen the DVD where they talk about the three different choices they had. Um, and they were gonna try to hide it from the crew. Well, I was one of the crews of one of the departments that was able to get the full script from the very beginning because it was a moving action thing. You had to, you had to know what was coming because you might need time to get it prepared, made, or whatever. So they said, Dave, uh, uh, Jeff, David wants to see you up in the office. So for me, that was upstairs. <laughs> I'm going upstairs again. Um, so I walk in the room, Hardy Payton is in there, David is in there, um, uh, Mary Sweeney was in there, and um, David goes, Jeff, I need you to find me the biggest, everything was like, just like that, this was, <laughs> this was how he approached it, the biggest golf bag you could find. <laughs> <laughs> So I had, this was, you know, I got this script, script two weeks before we shot that, okay? So they were preparing me for what was coming. So I'm up there and I have to ask the question, why? What do we need this for? What's this bag going to do? Do you have any instructions? You know, what do I need to know that I don't? And I wasn't fishing. I didn't even think this was going to be a, the reveal that he revealed to me. Uh, but... Um, I knew that uh, Leland was kind of a key figure. You know, we just kind of knew that as a group. We kind of felt that Leland was the one, but they, they kept us on our toes a little bit. You know, there was a lot of Ben and Leo. I never went for the Leo thing. I never, I never bought into that. Uh, ben, eh, but Leland was real. You know. So he said, "Okay, Jeff, what I'm going to tell you right now." You can never tell anybody. You can't tell your team. You can't say anything. And I, <laughs> okay. He goes, this needs to carry a body in it. It needs to be big enough to put a body in it. And it needs to go into a trunk of Leland's car. <laughs> and so... You get it now, Jeff? <laughs> it literally was that. And I went, oh my God, I know who the killer is. <laughs> oh, and it was really, really, um, it was just one of those things that it was, um, okay, I know. No one else would have known this because there was nothing else being involved. The, the wardrobe was wardrobe and makeup was makeup, but this prop was the key thing to the reveal for me as who it was going to be. So um, I had to literally, I got the bag. I came back to the office to show David and Harley and all the powers that be. And uh, he made, I think it might have been Mary or maybe one of the girls that worked in the office. I can't remember who he made get into the bag. <laughs> <laughs> What I ended up doing was I brought in a big giant golf bag, regular bag with clubs in it, and then I brought the cover for it, which was a pro cover for, uh, you know, people who are pro golfers who are always on tour. They're keeping their, their clubs with them. So he, we went in there. I put out the bag, and he chose because I brought a couple. Um, he chose the one that he wanted, and he literally made. Um, one of the, the girls that worked in the office get inside of the bag. <laughs> and I just went, oh my God, this is just great. Isn't it just, isn't this great? This is all going on in my head. I'm thinking to myself. So that was kind of uh, how that all came about. And another thing is I had to make that look like he was carrying a body in that bag as he's coming through the house. If you remember when he leaves, exits the house, He's got his golf bag and he goes to the trunk of his car and he throws the bag in. Well, we had, I had to get a, 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 a natural weight uh, a dummy, you know, that weighed like a human. And then makeup took the arm, the hand that you see, Maddie's hand, um, and made her look dead, you know. So that's how that all came to be. And that was probably the biggest thing that ever happened as far as 
being told the ultimate secret. <laughs> I, I think the NDA has finally expired. Yeah, it's yeah. safe to tell that. Uh, let's talk about some of the props that you had to make rather than source. Uh, were, were there any favorites or, or particular challenges? Everybody remembers the black puzzle box, don't you? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Now that was the biggest challenge I ever had as far as Okay, this is real. This has to function. And the, one of the caveats in it was it had to drop. And at one point it had to drop in a shadow. So I, had to, I could only get one because I had no time whatsoever to get it completed and, and make it to camera on time. So I had a week or something like that. And I had to take it to one of the prop houses. I think Hand Prop Room did this one for me. And uh, they were changing it all the time. So the writers were in there doing their thing, destroying my flow, you know. <laughs> and, oh, okay, can you make it do this now? So when that prop came up, I actually am very proud of that. It, um, it had to be a box, within a box, within a box, within a box. <laughs> And uh, because the key is the ultimate find, right? Yeah. That's where we found the key. So um, I, we were shooting the scene. And whenever you see, uh, it, I think it was Pete, and they were all sitting there arguing and grabbing the box and doing all these things, right? And I'm off camera just freaking out <laughs> because I knew it was just slightly put together just enough because it had to, collapse, because I didn't have two. I just could do this one. So I kept, Scott Cameron, you cannot let these actors drop. You cannot, you've just got to help me here. So my team would be underneath camera, underneath uh, uh, the actors with a Fernie pad. <laughs> because they had to drop it on camera like this at some point. Then we would turn around and get the drop. You know, we would get it going into the blanket. Uh, I mean, onto the floor and revealing that other hidden drawer. Um, so um, we started doing uh, the scene, and I'm constantly reminding Scott <laughs> not to let them drop. So we've gone through a few takes and we kind of got it. And then, um, but not quite. And so there was a, one more take. And we did the take, and then right in the middle of the take, I, we weren't underneath, because we knew he was going to cut camera. A, a camera's going to be cut, and we'll be fine. Scott says, okay, drop the box. We're rolling, right? We're rolling. And uh, I mean, what? And they dropped the box, and it shattered. And I had so much more left to do with that box. <laughs> so I'm looking at Scott, Scott Cameron with just razor eyes. <laughs> and he knew that he messed up. So we had to take that. They had to advance somewhere else in the scene while we were trying to put this back together so we could complete it uh, so that we can reveal the box within the box. <laughs> so, uh, and the one thing I liked about that prop was the button system. Okay, yeah. you saw all the, yes. the little things like that. What was great about that is we got to, um, we had to make it work, and it had to not look like it was rigged. Thank God for um, not high definition television in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and we, um, we, I had a three button com combination on it that would activate pull out the drawer. So um, they're standing there. You know, if you remember the scene, they're all trying to get figured out. And I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. Um, but there was three that we couldn't touch because if he did it in one, two, three, it was going to open up. So that was an interesting thing. And the actors, uh, so we got that opened. We did that. And I loved that inside box. It was the, the design on the front with the astrological yeah. signs and all that was just, just really done well. And Okawita, who was our art director, had sort of given me the sketch to give to the artist at the, at the prop making house to paint this thing. And I was so proud of this thing. And then there was another box that had to come out. 
than the metal thing. Well, if you notice, when you watch it next time, you'll see that the box that comes out, the last box before the silver square, um, is about that thick, right? It's not a very big, it's what we could fit inside of it uh, to make this all reveal itself. And of course, the pin comes down and sh shatters that one. And then magically, that uh, metal thing is there. You know, it was an edit that was actually pretty darn good. <laughs> And then the next step with that, for me, was that I had to shoot that thing. <laughs> so, how am I going to make that thing look like it's just been shot? And so what I did was I drilled holes into it, and I got pliers out, and I started pulling it and pulling it and shredding it and shredding it and doing whatever I could to make it look like bullets went through it. And that was the whole, that was all that story was just for one Prop, <laughs> in, which wow. was one of my favorites. It's memorable. <laughs> it is memorable. Okay, I want to get to a couple of the uh, screen use props that we have here and, and talk about them and, and get to their origin stories. Uh, one of them is, uh, it might be hard to see out here, but uh, there's a gold name tag here from the Great Northern. Uh, I'll set the scene for you. Uh, season two, episode 19. Uh, Cooper and John Justice Wheeler are uh, ruminating on, on love by the fireplace, and a bellhop uh, delivers you a message to John yes. Justice Wheeler, and his name tag says Jeff Moore. Correct. <laughs> Tell us about that. That's where I Easter egg myself. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I actually had a name tag for all my team. I had Stephen Camp, who is actually Stephen Gibson now. And then I also had Rich Robinson and then myself. So of course we had to have name tags with our names on it, you know. And, and I'm not sure if Stephen or Rich has ever made it into the shot, but for some reason that one got a clean shot. And uh, I'm so glad you saw that. <laughs> Were you in the running to play Bellhop Jeff Moore? <laughs> no, I was not in the running. Uh, although that was a constant thing on our set, was that why don't we make him the bellman, or why don't we make him the this or her the that? And it was um, we would pull members of our, our our crew into the scenes, and a lot of people made it into the show. I unfortunately did not make it in. I wanted to, but I was never there. A prop master is never there. Prop master is always on the road getting ready for the next. You have to be ready, and if you're not ready, you're gone. So, I mean, I was there a lot, 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 but there was a lot of times when I was, during working hours, nine to five-ish, I was at prop houses, so I missed a lot of those hours. Well, maybe in season four, uh, the character <laughs> Uh, let's talk about this evidence tag right here. Oh, yeah. Uh, season 2, episode 15, that was the Diane Keaton episode. Uh, Albert Rosenfield places a stack of photos of Caroline Earle's clothing on the table, and each one has an evidence tag. Wyndham Earl has sent them to different police stations. Uh, so this is a prop within a prop. It is a prop within a prop. Um, most of the black and white photos that you see on the show I took um, because I didn't really have an onset um, photographer. Uh, Paula Samatsu, who you might see her name on the credits, she was the, our publicist, helped me with Flesh World and helped me uh, with evidence photos quite a bit. And there was a couple of things. I think in that scene there might have, there was um, not only that prop, but it was also the bullet. And if you remember the bullet, that was in the tape measure next to the bullet. Do you remember that? I think that was a different scene, but similar black and white photo. Similar black and white, similar in the storyline as to where it would have been. It was another part of that whole uh, rabbit hole they were going down. And um, when I did this one, I had to go to wardrobe for shoes and the dress and um, find a, a place where I could shoot in black and white where it actually looked, if you remember the photo, it was pretty black, except for the white that popped. And I really didn't know what to do. This was all my choice. 
this was not, um, some told me to do that. I said, how will they take this? How, what was my experience in other police shows and other things I had done with evidence and evidence tagging? And so I remembered where I was, Twin Peaks. And so I chose an old fashioned tag with a string on it because that was the aesthetic that I carried with me through the whole show. This is not the real world. This is Twin Peaks. If I can show something that is uh, different, I'm going to do it. And so that's how that, that prop within a prop came in. I love that. That's a perfect example of the level of detail that, that went into Twin Peaks. As, you know, as to set it aside from uh, uh, other shows of, of, of the time. Uh, yes. Okay, one, one more question about one of these props we have here. Uh, the tape recorder in the front here, uh, that's, that's not Diane. Not uh, Diane. No. That's Bobby's tape recorder. No. When Bobby uh, found the tape, which is, this is going to be a double story. He found the tape in the heel of, of the boot, right? Yep. Um, he had to send this message off to, to Ben because he was trying to advance himself and move. He's, he's blackmailing Ben Horn. Correct. And so this was my way in, you know. And uh, so he, we had to get something different than Diane to get, uh, you know, to, to make this look like we're stealing props from somebody else's bag, you know. And um, I, I had this one existing in my, my kit. So I didn't go buy it. I had it, and I got lucky, <laughs> basically. Uh, but the other part of that, well, we were just asking about the, um, um, see, I'm old. <laughs> and my brain goes away sometimes. I forget things. Um, oh, the shoe. Now, we, <coughs> David came up, up, asked us over, asked me over one day on set, and uh, he goes, Jeff, you need to make the circle brand, you know, the circle brand on the heel of the boots. Does anybody remember that yes. at all? Yes. Okay. Well, that was made by my department. We, that heel does not exist in the world, real world. So what we did, when I was getting this instruction from David as to what he wanted, he sort of kind of drew an idea of what he wanted. He, um, I, I called my assistant Richard over because Richard was our graphics guy. I mean, I could count on him for many, many, many things. And um, I said, listen to the story. And so David told us what he wanted, how he wanted it to look. And so we, of course, nodded and said, of course, no problem, walked away. And I go, what are we going to do, Richard? Because I got an idea. And so we, you bought these sheets of letters that you peel them off, you know, and we got sheet, pulled off, circle, stuck it together, then put another layer on it, and then another layer. We did three layers to build up the stack to make it look like it was stamped into the shoe. Uh -huh. Then we got a washer from a tool, you know, in the toolbox, and stacked it twice on top of each other, because they're a little bit thicker than the letters. And then we gave it to David Robinson, who was, uh, ironically, the painter at this point, and not the prep guy, and, and he painted it black for us. And that's how Circle Brand came into existence. Wow. It came out of David's head, created in our department, which was like, wow, fun, you know. That was a good one. Yes. So. So we've, we've only got a little bit of time left. Sure. So uh, do you want to tell the people about uh, the book that you're working on? A little bit about it, because I am uh, i don't want to jinx my uh, creative flow by talking too much about it. But I'm working on a book right now uh, <laughs> uh, with um, uh, called Who Propped Laura Palmer. <laughs> and, yeah. is, and so my, my biggest challenge right now on the book because I could tell stories like I've just been telling forever, but is that a good book? Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Or is it, is it something uh, that I have to approach in a different way? Uh, because the show had all these different 
It was funny. It was mysterious. Mm -hmm. It was scary. You know, it was all of these elements that made it happen. So my choice now as a writer who is not a writer, um, I have to decide how I want to go down that road and what do I think that the fans would like and not just be just another voice in the wind about, you know, not knowing what I'm doing. In other words, I don't know. I have stories. I don't know how to write. So I'm kind of in that crossroads with it right now. But I've already started it, and I've got a chapter in. And it basically talks about my arrival into Twin Peaks, because everybody arrives to Twin Peaks. There is, you come into, that's my beginning of my story is coming into Twin Peaks, which is like, <laughs> changed my life. Here I am 30 years later talking about it. And it's just a wonderful thing. I'm so blessed. Excuse me for being emotional. But it's true. It, it's so true. It really is. So. We're lucky fans to have uh, actors and, and creative uh, creative people who have fleshed out this world that we could live in for, yes. for decades. And at this point, generations of people have enjoyed it. So we appreciate it. Thank you guys. You guys are you guys are what it's all about. Without you, this wouldn't carry on, you know. It's just a wonderful thing. All over the world. Yes. It's not only here, it's yes. everywhere. Yeah. The fandom is just an amazing machine that just keeps that spark going. And everybody appreciates it. I mean the actors are still making money even when they're not acting because of this show, which I really think is great. Yes. You know, they do these Comic Cons and different things. They're making money, and that's good. And someday, one of them's going to get in another show, or get another movie, or something that's going to push them into the next thing. So, you know, the fans really keep it alive. It's all about you. Thank you guys so much for watching, and thank you, Jess, for, for joining us. It's been a, a pleasure. Who propped Laura Palmer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the T-shirt that my um, that my uh, department made at the end of the season. Uh, we all made T-shirts, and we took um, one of the mugs, some donuts, took a picture, came up with the phrase "Who propped Laura Palmer?" And there's the T-shirt. So I hope to get some of these made in the future. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. All right. On that note, we've got a, a couple more panels coming up shortly uh, with some actors from the show. And uh, yeah, stick around. Thank you all. Thank you.